Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design the Dutch Podcast. Our guest today is Rama Girawo. Welcome, Rama. It's great to be here, Lefteris. Um, an absolute pleasure. Fantastic, fantastic. Tell us about you and your path so far. So I feel like I'm a lifelong student and a lifelong educator. I started, um, I started life really as an engineer and then uh, went across to design. And it did feel like those two things were separate. You know, one very science-based, the other very human-based. Uh, I studied mechanical engineering, then I went on to do industrial design. But I feel one of the greatest uh, uh, kind of tools for in my education career was actually learning Indian classical music um, and Indian philosophy, uh, life coaching as well. So there has been a whole um, a range of educative experiences that I've had within my career. Oh, fantastic. What instrument did you learn? The best instrument, the human voice. Okay, wow. So, wow. Yes, we call it the king of instruments. Of course, of course, of course. I mean, I, I was a violinist for many, 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 many years. So yes, of course. I, I often find that, you know, within design and design education, a lot of us have done singing or dance or musical instruments. You know, the the, the artistic endeavor burns brightly within you when you're in this creative space. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us about the project you're working on now. So now I am the director of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design at London's Royal College of Art. The center exists really for one reason, and that is to use design to improve life. And that is at the fundament of what we do. It's at the heart. So the kind of projects that we do, apart from some rapid response projects for COVID, which I think almost every designer on earth has turned their mind and attention to, we use design in a number of different ways. We focus on design for an aging population, people of all ages, all abilities, and really look at that kind of diversity we focus on healthcare, but we also look at inclusive design where, uh, for business impact and social impact. So some of the projects we've done recently have been looking at um, uh, issues such as suicide, issues such as exclusion by age, um, paranoia, um, psychosis. We're doing a project right now that uses virtual reality environments to help people who've been diagnosed with some level of psychosis to be able to retrain and re-enter um, society. So a simple thing like going into a cafe and ordering a coffee can be a challenge. So what if you were to be able to train virtually before you actually have to do that physically? So we've done about 300 projects over the last 20, uh, 20 years with 200 organizations. So life is never boring. Every day brings you a new challenge, new thoughts, new ideas, and a new context. So tell us about the link to education. And I know you're, you're also doing uh, some teaching. Uh, so tell us about uh, how you got involved in education and uh, what you've done so far on that. Yes. So education, I think, is something that is a human experience. It's lifelong. Whilst we don't formally teach at the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, we um, run modules, we do executive education, we link with students, we run modules for other universities, and we do do um, uh, uh, shorter forms of teaching with students. We are at a teaching institution, the Royal College of Art, and we are very much placed within academic research and education. So some of the things that we like to practice is that you know, education is not just about uh, knowledge, about information. It's also about experience. I believe that you know, um, knowledge produces the greatest teachers, experience produces the greatest learners. And that, I think, is at the heart of what we look to do. Even when we do executive education, 
I think that's incredibly important because it do doesn't just mean it's for executives. It, it's a term I'd love to change. It's just life education. Um, it's education for people as part of their continuous development professionally and personally. But we, we like to give people information, in, inspiration and experience. And these three things come together within any learning environment, within any teaching environment. We also follow some principles whereby we learn as well. So every time we teach, every time we impart uh, knowledge, we learn, we gain, it's a gain. So there's sort of two authors that really informed this attitude. One was Khalil Gibran, who talks about teaching walking you to the boundaries of your own experience, you open a door and you watch someone walk through and that's what you do. And I love that, that, kind, that, that vision, that philosophy, that ideology, because you can put it into practice. The other person was Richard Bach, who talks about you all being learners, teachers and doers. And that is the human ex experience. You know, he, he speaks about, um, learning being the, the, the first part, teaching being the second part, and then doing is actually demonstrating that you know it. So I think there's something, there's a richness in that, in that, in that tripartite uh, way of thinking about education. And it's, it's never that you are the one in charge, you facilitate learning, you co-learn, you co-experience. So it's not opening someone's head, pouring a glass of knowledge in and then closing it again. Education is a magical experience. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you've, also, you've also taught uh, abroad uh, as well? Yes. So tell us yes. about the experience. So from, um, from Canada to China, I've had the great privilege um, uh, of experiencing time with students, uh, with human beings, with designers, with non-designers across the world. And you learn some things such as your preconceptions get challenged. And that is a beautiful thing. That is an educative experience that reflects back in a healthy way on yourself. You get to share experiences with many others. Um, the cultural differences, you know, one, one thing um, I never want to do as an educator is be some kind of Victorian missionary or some kind of paternalist where you go out and convert people to your framework of thinking. And when we work in different areas of the world, something that's incredibly important for me is that you genuinely go there to learn yourself. You partner with those organizations, those companies, those institutions that are embedded in the culture. And if not, we don't go. And if not, we, we don't say we're gonna teach. We say we're going to run a co-learning experience. And I think the language of that is incredibly important. I wanna share with you one story, which is, um, comes from Qatar. We were working with um, a group out there that was talking to migrant workers and they brought in philosophers, economics, engineers, and finally they thought, oh, there's something here in this design field. There's something here that is about human research and understanding and then deployment. And we have this amazing series of four day workshops where we had students and professors from different universities. There was medical universities, there was law, there was journalism and design and architecture. And one of the most educative experiences for me was when we wanted to look at the idea of preconception. You know, where, where, where are you? These, the students and the teachers were pretty enabled people. They actually lived in a radically different place from migrant workers many of whom were sharing rooms, you know, eight people in a room on a kind of triple bunk bed, living on five to seven US dollars a day. 
one of the most educative experiences was to say to the students, the teachers, you've got to live on five to seven US dollars a day, which means you're probably spending one to two US dollars on food. And it means anything like an iPhone, any, um, you know, any, any, any sort of expensive item you can't use, you can't entertain yourself with. And we said we would do the same thing. It turns out you eat a lot of bread. Um, it turns out you have difficulty entertaining yourself. And when we, you know, there were so many challenges that came into our lives and that didn't come from a classroom experience. That came from an immersive one. The other thing that happened is we showed them pictures of migrant workers from previous projects that we've done and just asked them to be very, very honest. I mean, education is also about getting the people that are on this learning experience into an honest space. So, so, so they, they look within themselves, you know, the journey within is the really important one. And we asked them to say, you know, the first three words that came to their mind. They said things like sweaty, dirty, poor. And I salute them for being honest because sometimes when you have a voice playing in your head that's an amalgamation of previous perspectives and kind of historic attitudes, you may not want to say it, you edit it out, but we ask them to give us the unedited version. So we put that on the wall. And one thing I reflected back to them is I said, no one said father, brother, no one said son or grandson. And this is the reason why these people are here. They're typically second sons. And out of filial piety, you know, they're sent abroad, but they're supporting many people back home. They're supporting a family back home. So their role here is that of a dutiful son or a father or a brother. And that change, that was a magic moment in the room where the, the room sort of reverberated with learning. And it was a learning of this, this, these are my preconceptions. The, the, the experiments and the experiences that happened after that had a radically different flavor. It was a, a conversations were much more equitable, much more dignified, much more human. So what is your uh, sort of, what would you say about teaching and learning uh, overall? So if you could give us like a summary from being an international experience, including England, uh, what would be your, your idea on design education specifically? Design education, I think I can sum it up in four words that I talk about myself. I say human first, design a second. And that's the importance. Design is a magical experience. It's a magical field. Why? Because everything we see, almost everything we see in the world around us has been designed. You know, most of the things most of us will touch in a day, even in rural communities. You know, you mentioned England and it's where I, where I, I am. You know, I'm in London, born, born in London, living in England. You know, I always say my home is London, but my heart is global. <laughs> and um, the countryside here is a beautiful place. You know, the English countryside is an amazing thing. But when you look at how that has been crafted and curated, you know, even forests have been managed for years and years. So even nature in this little island of ours is designed. So design is everywhere. And if something has gone through a design decision, you need to make sure it's gone through a good one. I think everyone has that ability to be a designer, to create. You know, I talk in education, I talk about design with a capital D, which is the professional experience and design with a lowercase d, a smaller d, which is everyone. So, you know, we design our lives, our breakfasts, our outfits, you know, you and I designed our outfits, what we're wearing, and we're not wearing the same thing. Um, you know, our, our beard shapes, our words, our education. 
um, all of these things have been designed. We're even designing this experience right now and kind of co-creating a conversation space. So when we, when we think about design as educators, the other word that comes to mind is responsibility. And that's the human first bit. We are responsible for an experience. We are responsible for that experience being positive or negative. We are responsible if someone um, can have a great experience um, opening a jam jar or whether they are prohibited from that. The very foundation of the Helen Hamlin Center comes from this because Helen Hamlin is a real person. You know, she's a graduate of the Royal College of Art. Um, she's a very vibrant and vocal personality and very passionate about design. And what she realized years ago, almost before um, uh, many people were thinking about this, she realized that design had some failings. The design world was actually disabling people. So people had ambitions. You know, if we think of our mothers or grandmothers, you know, they, 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 they are these capable, enabled individuals, but the design world can actually um, end up with you being in a care home. And I've seen this happen to so many friends and relatives um, in the, you know, in the family scape that, you know, an occupational therapist will do their job. But if you can't get into the bath, if you can't open a jam jar, can't do so many things, that's an issue of design. And within design education, I think opening people up to that responsibility and that ability, the flip side of responsibility is ability, that ability to create. And from the US and Canada and South America all the way to the other side of the world, I am incredibly excited by the next generation of designers because I've seen a change over the last 20 years. You, you see people who don't want to hero the project. Sorry, you see people who don't want to hero themselves. They want to hero the project. They want to leave positive fingerprints on the world. And some of them don't even want to leave fingerprints. They want to leave that world, leave the world a better place. And that may sound idealistic, but I see it in the ambitions of the designers that are being educated today. It's not their name that they want up in shining lights. It's their projects, their, their abilities, their energies that they want to have some sense of reverberation, some sort of small touch. We were talking about this before you and I, and design doesn't have to be a grandiose thing. You know, when you say human first, you start at the level that is right for you. And often that means starting within, looking at your strengths, your, your challenges, your capabilities, the, that journey within. And there is a, a poem that I share quite a lot that I think will say, you know, design, we talk about big things and um, things that can be, uh, you know, massively enabled. Um, how do we start? <laughs> and this poem was given me, given to me by my mother when I asked her the same question. And it's, it's from India's poet laureate Rabindranath Tagore. And what he said is this, who will take up my work, asked the setting sun. And throughout the land, no one answered. Alone in the corner, dusty and forgotten, the earthenware lamp said, I will, my Lord, as best I can. So you do not need to be a streetlight, a lamppost, the sun or the moon. A simple clay pot, a simple lamp can shine enough light when you need it. And that's all you need to do with yourself as a designer, as an educator, as a receiver of education, and as an instigator of education. You just start at your level. Start and you will, you, the internal light that you have will shine brightly in a place that the world needs you to.
it was very inspiring. It was very, very inspiring. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, uh, the UK has been instrumental in shaping design education, especially our, our PRCA, and the, the, there used to be a department of, of design education. I've been talking about this before. Uh, and, and it has um, gone through a lot of changes uh, to, to, to come to the... Oh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, of course. I mean... Um, we had a we had a little bit of a um, we had a little bit of a lockdown problem. The the, the UK has been instrumental uh, yeah. in shaping design education. Uh, there was a, even a department of design education up to 1984 at, at the RCA. Uh, so it has changed to to, to to this level. So if if you could uh, change anything, if there was no limitation at all. Uh, what would you change or replace or remove or uh, what is your what is your opinion on that? I love this question. Um, I call this the Harry Potter question. If you if you had the magic wand <laughs> to change anything, um, and I love it, love it because it allows you to to dream big. I I think the very simple thing to me. And sorry if, I, if it sounds like I'm repeating an answer, is bringing a sense of humanity um, into the educative process. So engaging with the topics of the day, engaging, in, engaging with a deep level of humanity, the issues that we see erupting around us, understanding the role that we play in this as human beings, I think is incredibly important, whether you're a chemist, physicist, a nurse, a mechanic, um, you know, a lawyer, a doctor, um, someone working in services, you know, in the travel industry, or even a designer. I mean, especially a designer. I think that for me is the one thing I would want to change. You know, when one human hurts, I think all humans hurt. And we are seeing that in 2020 in spades, not just with viral pandemics, lockdown fatigue, but also in terms of what it means to be a person of color and the rising voices that we see of people of all colors um, because the situation demands it. And I actually, in amidst things like pain and anger, which have been a catalyst for thinking differently and thinking more deeply. I also see hope and positivity in that, you know, when someone cried out in pain on the, the, the hard tarmac um, of a pavement in America, um, the world has cried out and responded. And maybe we're not doing it so well. And my God, we have so much more to do. And bringing that into an educative in environment just adds meaning. It gives meaning to existence. And this may sound like a grand gesture, but I honestly believe education is part of that. And education isn't something that happens in a classroom. Education happens on the street. It happens in the richness of your experience. Education is the nudging of perspective. It's the bringing of your life into greater understanding and into greater balance. So if we're talking about classroom education, the big change would be, would be that, and the intention would be to bring these wider experiences of education into the classroom and a recognition that education is a human experience, it's a human condition. Sometimes education um, can, can be a painful thing. And I think that is part of the human journey. When you realize the challenges that others have and the, the challenges that you face so, some, so I think always like to think of it as internal and external. There's an education that goes on in the external world, which goes beyond the classroom, but there is an internal education, an internal growth 
that also happens. So how we bring that into a visible vibrancy, that's what I'd love to use my Harry Potter wand for. Absolutely. I mean, the more united we are, you know, the better equipped we are able to face these challenges. Um, you know, so this is, uh, this is uh, the message for me is, is unity and, and not, and not yeah. separation is, is, can be very dangerous. So uh, how can our viewers and listeners best find you? Oh, <laughs> well, um, thankfully I have a unique surname and that's not uh, because it's special. It's because of a spelling mistake that was made in 1838. <laughs> so when my ancestors stepped off a boat as indentured laborers from India and they were brought to South America to work the cane fields, so Demerara sugar, that's where uh, you know that term came from. When they stepped off the boat, our name was misspelt, and. Um, so that means there's very few of us um, in the world on Google. So I would love for people to connect with me, um, uh, you know, on social media. I'm on Instagram, which is literally my name, Rama Garawa. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. I use Twitter less, but Instagram is a pretty uh, surefire bet. Please don't send me an email directly because email nowadays is like trying to take a drink from a fire hydrant. <laughs> it's, you know, it's one little glass of water and there's a fire hose going off with the amount of email. It's almost slightly self-defeating. But social media would love to um, hear from, hear from uh, um, uh, viewers um, with your thoughts and education, your sharings, because that will also, in turn, educate myself. Absolutely. I mean, you've told us many inspiring things today. Uh, is there any last uh, remarks you'd like to leave us with? I think, I think it's just this. Um, 2020 has seen a lot of things for me personally and professionally. We all know the things that are going on in the world, but I also lost my father. Um, on the 1st of January, 2020, you know, the start of a year, the start of a decade. It has been an interesting and a challenging year and a year of growth in many, many ways and a year of barriers and a year of self-reflection. And I think what's come out of it for me is a couple of things. One is that to let your passion align with your purpose and you will have the most powerful thing within you to take you forward. You will always learn. You will always be open to learning. You will never feel that you have to defend a position because when you're so open, you hold all positions <laughs> and you hold every position. I think Gandhi put this best when he said, I will open the doors and windows of my house to allow all cultures to blow through them, but I refuse to be blown off my feet. So that's one thing. And I think the other thing from my personal thoughts from 2020 is about bringing the world into balance. We see so much imbalance, you know, it's the nature of the world, but we try to treat imbalance with imbalance quite often. And how do you, as an individual, as a human being, as a, a person with capabilities, how do you bring the world within you and around you into balance? So that's my question that I leave you with. That's fantastic, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Rama. Thank you so much. I've had a real blast. Thank you. A real pleasure and honor.